Welcome to the Federalist Society's webinar call. Today, April 21st, we discuss criminal market allocation or pro-competitive agreement, the debate over the DOJ's no-poach prosecutions. My name is Guy DeSanctis, and I'm Assistant Director of Practice Groups at the Federalist Society. As always, please note that all expressions of opinion are those of the experts on today's call. Today, we are fortunate to have with us our moderator, Pepper Crutcher, partner at Balch and Bingham, and chairman of the Labor and Employment Law Practice Group at the Federalist Society. Throughout the panel, if you have any questions, please submit them through the question and answer feature so that our speakers will have access to them for when we get to that portion of the webinar. With that, thank you for being with us today. Pepper, the floor is yours. Thank you, Guy, and welcome, everyone. Um, I have the honor to introduce three panelists. Uh, the one you'll hear from first is Barry Nigro, who is chair of Freed Frank's Global Antitrust and Competition Department. Barry recently served as the Principal Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the DOJ's Antitrust Division, where he was responsible for civil and criminal enforcement. And prior to that, as Deputy Assistant Attorney General. He's also served as Deputy Director of the Federal Trade Commission's Bureau of Competition. You'll also hear from Lindsay Bala, who's in private antitrust practice at Vincent and Elkins, where she's been a partner uh, for 13 years. She's a member of the firm's global cartel defense and coordination team with special emphasis on cartel and is criminal antitrust matters and related class actions. Lindsay works with corporate leaders to design bespoke compliance programs and policies. Favorite part of her practice is training executives and employees regarding antitrust issues. She's twice been appointed to serve as co-chair of the ABA antitrust sections, cartel and criminal practice committee a position she currently holds. Before joining v &E, Lindsay Clerk in the Alexandria Division of the Eastern District of Virginia, and um, like Zach, graduated from William & Mary Law School. Lindsay's undergraduate degree is from Davidson College, and she has a master's from NYU. Zach Terwilliger, our third panelist, is also a VE &E partner, been with DOJ before that for 14 years, most recently as U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia. Zach also served as Associate Deputy Attorney General at the main DOJ headquarters and as an AS, AUSA in the Eastern District of Virginia. Prior to DOJ, Zach was a law clerk to the Honorable Michael K. Moore of the United States District Court for the Southern District of Florida. He graduated with highest honors from William & Mary and obtained his undergraduate degree at the University of Virginia Wahoo Wah. I, as a moderator, I'm casting the role of a semi-ignorant onlooker, for which I am so well suited by my chairmanship of the Labor and Employment Practice Group, which gives me only the most tangential relationship to crimes, prosecutors, and other things that go bump in the night. I'll be asking Barry to explain to us, to start, how in the world employer hiring and compensation decisions work their way onto the DOJ criminal antitrust enforcement docket. Barry, take it away. Thank you, Pepper, and, and thank you to the Federalist Society for hosting this program. It's uh, coincidentally very timely given the outcomes in two of the antitrust division's first uh, prosecutions in, in this area. Um, to sort of understand how we got here, you need to sort of go back and, and look at where we started. And, and uh, you can go all the way back a good 10 years or more. I mean, there's, there's nothing sort of remarkable to those who practice antitrust law to the notion that naked agreements not to compete um, are per se illegal and are um, in some cases uh, prosecuted criminally. That's uh, you know, been sort of black letter law for, for many years. What, what is new is is, is the application of those, those principles in the labor context. And, and, and that started you know, back um, really before, uh, you know, in, in the Obama administration and, and, and all the way back with the prosecutions uh, of, of some non-solicit agreements among a bunch of tech companies, uh, uh, eBay, Intuit, Lucasfilm, Pixar, Adobe, Apple, Google, Intel, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, those were subsequently followed in October of 2016, just before the election, with the policy that uh, came out for 
human resource professionals, a joint policy from the antitrust division and uh, the FTC. Unlike, um, it, it's called a guidance document, but unlike you know, some of the other guidance documents that, that have been published by the agencies, such as the merger guidelines, which have gone through a notice and comment uh, process, I, I don't believe this one did. It, 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 it just appeared in, in October, 2016. And it, it, it kind of walks through in, in, in the way you might expect from a law firm memo, sort of some of the, the, the do's and don'ts with respect to uh, HR um, uh, uh, activities. Uh, and, and, and talks about right at, right at the beginning, it talks about how the uh, agreements among competing employers, it says, may violate the antitrust laws. So, so that's how it starts. And, 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 and as you work into the document and eventually get to page four, you get to the part that, that, uh, that we're going to focus on today, where the, um, the agencies announced that going forward, uh, the DOJ intends to proceed criminally against naked wage fixing or no poaching agreements. And they, they then later in the paragraph talk about no poach as in a, an agreement uh, among employers with respect to employee compensation or not to solicit or hire each other's employees. So um, that's the first time that, that the agencies have, have, have said in a, in, a, in a clear way that they intend to go after these sorts of things criminally. Um, it, it, it's, it's not been done before. Uh, that was, as, as I said, October 2016. Uh, the Trump administration came in in, uh, in January. There was a hold put on uh, AAG Macon Dowerheim, so he actually didn't start until the end of September of 2017. And, and one of the first things that uh, the administration had to do is figure out what to do with this policy document um, and, 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 and you know, wh whether to go forward with it and how to implement it. And a lot of time and thought was given to that. And, and the decision was made that, 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 that uh, to go forward, but, but to try to provide some, some clarity as to, you know, uh, and, and answer some of the questions that people were asking in the wake of it, such as, um, you know, what's per se, what's rule of reason, what's criminal, what's civil, you know, how do you define the relevant market? A lot of people get confused on the relevant market question because they all think in terms of downstream competition and agreements not to compete with respect to hiring employees um, among downstream competitors. But that's not how the agencies are thinking about it. The agencies are thinking about, um, let's say, tech firms. If there are two tech firms that are competing to hire software engineers, whether they're competing downstream is not really relevant or, or to, to, to the analysis of, of, of any agreement with respect to hiring. And, and then there's the sort of monopsony, the, the, the sort of angle. Most of the criminal cases that, that the uh, DOJ has brought have focused on the sale of products or services. And so people intuitively understand um, what it means when there's an agreement not to compete or to fix prices with respect to customers downstream. I think when you flip that upside down and you you ask people to apply that same principle to the purchase of, of, of labor services, it has the potential to get confusing. And, 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 and you'll see this in the civil context, potentially with the, uh, the pending merger trial involving the booksellers, which is a monopsony case. It's challenging Penguin and Random House under a monopsony theory. And, 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 and in some respects, it's just the mere image of monopoly but in other respects, it raises interesting questions because sometimes uh, uh, the, 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 the coordination could result in lower costs, lower prices that get passed on to consumers. And, and I think there's a tendency sometimes to get confused by that. And when we talk about the DeVita case and the Jindal case and the acquittals there, um, I think when we get into the facts, you'll see that that, 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 that may be in part an explanation for why the, the division wasn't able to get convic convictions. And then there's like a whole set of agreements that, that, that people typically refer to as non-competes that are vertical or maybe imposed by a franchisor among the franchisees. And, and how should you think about those? And, and, and what's the difference between sort of unilateral conduct and joint conduct? So there's all these questions that 
um, that that this this policy statement raises and, and are now going to be sort of in in, in 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 different ways show up in the litigation and in 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 in, uh, in the in, in the defense of these of these cases. So from 2007, 17, really late 17, 18, and 19, um, most of the division's efforts were focused on trying to sort of bring some clarity through the filing of amicus briefs and uh, enforcement actions. There was the, uh, the, 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 the case in 2018, it was a civil case um, brought against uh, some, some uh, uh, rail equipment suppliers. And that was pursued civilly in large part because it uh, the agreement terminated before the 2016 policy statement. And there was a sense that that, uh, that 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 it wouldn't be appropriate to prosecute that criminally since the policy statement had not been made at that time. And so, in the exercise of prosecutorial discretion, um, the, the, the decision was made to 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 uh, prosecute those those civilly. Um, during that time, there were. I would say probably over two dozen uh, investigations of various sorts, some of them uh, preliminary, some of them uh, uh, much more expansive uh, involving, uh, I'll just say no poach to use the broad, you know, but, but in the broad sense, no poach situations. And, and, and frankly, I was surprised when I got there how often this, this issue came up, especially in merger reviews. Um, and, and, and so the department, the division went about its, its work in, in investigating those. Um, and, 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 and one of the challenges, and, 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 and this is another reason that the department may have had some trouble on these first couple of cases was COVID. Um, grand juries weren't meeting, uh, gathering facts. The FBI wasn't available to go, go knock on people's doors and collect facts facts as they have in, in, in most criminal cases. And so COVID was, was, was definitely um, a, a, a challenge, a headwind. And, and, and that's, you know, while, while for many of us, we're back in the office and, and it's going away, um, you know, the department, I think, is coming back two days a week or um, starting in May. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's going to continue to be a challenge to, 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 to undertake these investigations when, um, when, when you've got sort of the, the, the COVID overhang, there's also sort of a headcount challenge uh, with the division, they're way behind on, uh, on FTEs. They've got over 146 grand, pending grand juries, I think I heard from, from Richard Powers, which is, um, has to be near or, or, or possibly an all time high. Uh, uh, as I said, their headcount's down 25% from 10 years ago. There are um, a number of cases teed up on the criminal side for trial. There's, I think, six, a half a dozen on the civil side merger cases, which is which is unprecedented. And and so I, at some point, you have to, you know, ask: Is there a limit on the capacity of the division to to, to litigate all these things? And then on top of that, you know, I, I I think a big issue, and and I'm sure we'll get into this some more, is is the novelty that flows from an agreement not to purchase a good or service, um, the monopsony question. And, and, I, and I think you saw in DeVita, the judge in, in, in his decision uh, uh, in, or in, her, in, in the decision with respect to uh, the jury instructions actually you know, referenced the novelty of the case and decided uh, to depart from the instructions that are typically given in customer allocation cases. So, so there's, there's a number of, 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 of challenges that the division is going to have to overcome uh, in order to get convictions here. And, and uh, you know, but if you ask me, you know, given these two outcomes, uh, what's the probability that the, uh, that the division will back off on, on bringing these cases? I, I, I would say it's the probability is probably 0%. There's no way they're backing off. They, they really believe in this. It's important. Um, it's a centerpiece of the administration's policy when it comes to labor. And, and so I'm expecting that we'll see more cases and, 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 and there'll be more resources put into it and more thought put into how to try these cases so that the juries understand um, what, 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 what the, why the division is prosecuting them and why they should be um, uh, treated criminally. So I'll, 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 I'll stop there, but I think that, 
that that's sort of the background that that, that got us here. Well, Pepper. Zach, Lindsay, uh, Barry has explained how we got here. Um, tell us, in any order you prefer, what it means to be a defense lawyer now that we're here in these kind of cases. Yeah, Zach, do you want me to start, or you want to go? I mean, um, Pepper, if it's all right with you, I think what, let me just add in a couple pieces of context in case we have a couple folks who are less versed than um, Barry and Lindsay and, and others on this. Is I'll, I'll take about 30 seconds to just give you a, a little bit more of the 40,000 foot view. So for those of you who are not antitrust specialists and are hearing about this because it's incredibly timely right now, you know, one thing to just keep in mind when we're talking about the Section 1 of the Sherman Antitrust Act and what we're basically saying is, you know, there are these three established categories um, of hardcore criminal conduct, um, which involve bid rigging, price fixing, and market allocation. And what this whole discussion is really about how that's, um, those three categories have been expanded. Um, and basically what we're going to get into in the no-poach, um, non-solicit, no-hire space is market allocation for employees. And in the Jindal case, what we're going to talk about is how price fixing, um, at least according to a judge and a charging theory, um, relates uh, to wage fixing. So that's, that's really where we are and, and what we're going to focus on. And let me kick it over to Lindsay, um, who's been watching all of this and, and frankly been a thought leader on it. Um, in private practice um, while these different machinations were going on in government. Yeah, thanks, Zach. I've, I've, I think I'm the only one on the panel who's only been on the defense side the whole time through this. And Barry, it was really interesting to hear your, your kind of summary of how the division was thinking about this, because during that same time frame, we were re wrestling with how do we advise clients? You know, we, we saw the high tech cases. They were civil enforcement actions. They seemed unique sort of technology companies on the West Coast. Obviously, there was a class certification, I think 64,000 people in a class before Judge Coe in California, settlements to the tune of 400 million, but again, all on the civil side. And then that, you know, fast forward to 2016, we get this guidance that, you know, from the defense side sort of came out of nowhere and was unique. Like you pointed out, there was really no comment period, no kind of indication, at least from my perspective, that this was coming. And then what do you tell a client? You know, I, I started writing about this pretty quickly and people even within my own firm were like, this isn't going to be a thing, right? And we watched Washington State start to prosecute non-competes in like the fast food space. We saw the division file amicus briefs and statements of interest in civil cases. We saw the rail supplier case, which was civil 18 months after this guidance saying it's all going to be criminal or it's going to be criminal. And so it was this interesting dance of how to advise clients that we do think this is coming. We can't tell you when, and we can't tell you necessarily what it's going to look like, but this is the time to look at your compliance programs, talk to your HR people who are probably not the, the, the class of employees that you're largely giving your interest training to and bring them into the fold. And one of the, the lessons from the high tech cases was how easy these agreements are to reach. They're often reached at the very highest levels of the company, CEOs, senior executives, who make the agreement and then tell their HR people, their external recruiters, what the agreement is, the rules of the road, and then ask those folks to, to carry it out. And I think that's why the 2016 guidance was really targeting human resource professionals as the people who could really, you know, raise the red flag and say, this, you know, we can't be doing this. So we got the 2016 guidance. We wait, we wait, we wait. And then finally, in December of 2020, we get the first indictment, which is a wage fixing case. And then I think within a matter of weeks, we get the first actual no poach indictment, which was surgical care in the Northern District of Texas. So, you know, against the backdrop, Pepper, with your, you know, your clients and your practice, you've got kind of interesting labor issues. How do you advise clients about their non-competes and their restrictive covenants? And how does that, how do those type of agreements come into this? And so it's been a really interesting dance to advise clients about how to how to avoid criminal prosecution, but also, you know, how to think about their their labor and employment agreements and other joint ventures and other types of agreements that kind of raise some of these same issues. You know, on, on the non-compete um, front and, and, you know, I, I would uh, you know, people may have missed this, but the department filed recently a amicus brief and a I believe it's a state court case against uh, Pickard Medical Group. And if you look at how they talk about the non-compete and the way they frame the argument and the logic of it, even in a case challenging non-compete agreements that you might 
instinctively think of as vertical because it's between a medical group and its doctors. What um, the division said recently is that, you know, these are agreements, therefore they're con concerted action. And, and, and then they say, because the doctors actually are competing um, in the market themselves, that it should be viewed, while it might have vertical dimensions, it should be viewed horizontally. And then because it's horizontal and an agreement, the burden shifts to the defendants to explain why it's a reasonably necessary uh, restraint in furtherance of a pro-competitive venture, which is this, you know, standard joint venture analysis. And, and, uh, and, and, and so it, 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 it kind of tilts like, in, in, in favor of the plaintiffs in, in, in the way it, it presents the argument. And, and, and that I think is a reflection of how the division is going to be thinking about these issues going forward during uh, during the Biden administration, they're 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 they view, they're going to view them skeptically, and they're going to look at look look to defendants to explain why isn't this per se, and and why isn't it criminal, and 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 explain to us, you know, what the rationale is for for this restraint, why it's reasonable, why there's no less restrictive alternative, and so on. Yeah, I mean, picking up on that a little bit, I mean, one of the things that really struck me, you know, coming into private practice from uh, from a long period in government service, you know, you're always looking at these, you know, when you're talking about criminal justice reform and mens rea, um, you know, what you're really talking about, and, and this gets into the DeVita case, um, as, as Barry mentioned, we just, there was just a trial that the division had um, out in Colorado where there was acquittals across the board in this no poach case um, called DeVita, including its CEO. Um, Kent Theory, and, and basically there, the you know the facts of the case were you had one company that was allegedly agreeing with two other companies um, not to solicit and not to hire each other's employees, and in certain instances it was just a one-way non-solicit. We agree as company B not to solicit um, employees of Davida, and, and the only way you know they they can actually interview is if they tell us first, and, and those sorts of things. And typically under the per se standard, and one of the reasons why you have those three categories of criminal offense under the per se standard is they're established. There's judicial precedent, people are on notice. You cannot rig bids, you cannot fix prices, and you cannot allocate markets. And so um, in a lot of the pretrial briefing that you saw in both the DeVita case as well as surgical care, which were done by you know, foremost um, appellate experts, um, Paul Clement in surgical care and Seth Waxman um, in DeVita, um, really set that up and, you know, a bunch of arguments made, you know, this, this should not be a per se case because there isn't judicial experience. This really should be rule of reason, therefore civil. It is not just a different type of market allocation. This is a new offense that you're creating and there's due process concerns because um, as we saw in uh, the DeVita case and has been present in, in other cases, you know, there's a pretty clear understanding that these individuals, these CEOs um, of various companies had no concept of what they were doing was wrong. And so you saw a lot of the briefing talking about, well, I wasn't on notice that this was wrong. And my own messages and, and back and forth clearly show that I didn't know this was wrong. Um, and so when, when you get down to it, um, you know, one of the things that you've heard the division, the antitrust division talk about in, in light of these cases are, you know, these are actually wins. Well, how can you have a win if everyone got acquitted? Well, as you look at the progression, let's take DeVita first. If you look at the progression of the DeVita case, it survived a motion to dismiss. And basically you had a judge there saying, yes, um, you can have a non-solicitation agreement um, be, the, be an example of market allocation, but not all non-solicit agreements. And, and it, left, it left an opening there. Um, but basically you had a judge saying, you know, no, I, I think this is the per se standard and the per se standard should apply. Um, one thing that, you know, Barry and Lindsay certainly can expound more upon um, is that under the per se standard, typically, it's just all the government has to show is an agreement. You, you know, Pepper and I just agreed um, that I'm not going to hire, you know, his best and brightest associates and he's not going to do the same for me. That's all that needs to be showed. Typically, you don't have to show that we understand that that's wrong or that we're intending to allocate the market for labor and employment and criminal and trust associates. But when you go to the DeVita case and you look at the jury instruction that was given, the judge in that case specifically said, you know, you, you need to find that they entered this agreement with the purpose of allocating the market. And, you know, assuming that jury instruction is used and it holds up and, and that, that catches on, 
that really, to me, is a shift in um, the burden of proof on the part of the prosecution, because I think oftentimes, like in any conspiracy case, you can establish that an agreement was made. But then if you have to show that that agreement included a specific um, intention to allocate a market as opposed to, as we saw in the DeVita defense, just not upset someone else in the business. People allegedly were intimidated by the CEO. And the reason they didn't want to hire from him was they didn't want to make an enemy out of him. Um, so I think that's pretty interesting. But let me let me kick it over to Barry. Yeah, I mean, I th I think that's uh, I mean that that's a good insight because I I believe that the um, the jury struggled with those issues. Um, they they the judge let them ask questions, and some of the questions were were, were practical questions like, um, you know, how do we decide whether the effect was of any consequence or or, or that this was significant, and um, those types of things are obvious when you have a price fixing case, right? You, you, you fix prices, um, the, the executives are getting paid tons of money, juries understand that, that they're profiting directly off of the price fixing. And, and, uh, and that, that's all intuitive and, 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 and it has you know, a clear feeling of fraud, um, right? And, and, and juries understand that. I think when you, when you turn it upside down and, and you're talking about these labor cases and monopsony and some of the dynamics that you described, Zach, with not wanting to upset their friend or play nice or whatever. Um, it's also not clear, like, even though there, there may be an aspect that, 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 that is saving the company money so that they, they, they by not having to compete and, and, and therefore their profits go up, I, I don't think the juries have the same intuition that they do with price fixing. I think, I think that one of the challenges that the division is going to have is to try to translate that into a, a, a something that the jury is going to understand and that will resonate with them um, and where they'll feel like, you know, these guys are engaged in something that feels very criminal in nature. And I got the sense from reading the reports on the DeVita trial, I wasn't there, so I don't have the benefit of firsthand knowledge that, 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 that some of the jurors struggled with that. Yeah, and I think too, you know, these labor cases are kind of coming on the heels of what very a decade or more of Asian-based car global cartel investigations, where the the conduct was pretty obvious and it mostly resulted in settlements. So we didn't have really very many criminal trials coming out of those. You know, we had SRAM and DRAM and auto parts, and you know, billions and billions of dollars worth of fines coming into division, but no no trials. But the evidence there was just so different than what we're seeing here. And I also wasn't at the Davida trial, but I have also been following along and, and reading the about the evidence. And I, you know, it strikes me that with the Asian cases, the the auto parts, you had emails that said destroy after reading and do not forward, and for a very limited distribution that that really suggested that that folks that were writing these emails knew that there was something not right about them. And you just don't have that yet. At least yet in these labor cases, people just don't know that what they're doing is, you know, considered illegal by the division. So I think that has been a, and juries probably do struggle with that. And that's been a really interesting piece for me to kind of think about as I kind of transition from the, the decade or more of, of, you know, very obvious cartel type investigations to this really novel space. Uh, let me remind our participants watching this to enter your questions in the chat box, please, so that we can see them uh, and answer them probably roughly in the order in which they're received. Um, I have a couple of questions proceeding, as I said in the beginning, from my ignorance, but I plan to ask uh, panelists, do you have any questions of each other you'd like to ask first? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I think is interesting is, you know, this started under, and I promise there's a question here, just a little preamble, you know, this started in 2016. Then, um, as Barry gave us a, a great insight into what was happening during the Trump years, um, when you saw a very aggressive antitrust division in terms of creation of the procurement collusion strike force and a focus on procurement fraud. And then you see these indictments come and they came during the lame duck period after the election. In fact, one came um, on January 5th. And so the country was certainly focused elsewhere on, on January 6th. And so it, it did sort of come out of nowhere. Um, we've heard a lot of what I would call saber, saber rattling and aggressive enforcement. There's been other talk um, about these monopol the monopolization cases and the FTC. So I guess a question, um, you know, first for Lindsay and then maybe for Barry is, you know, this this 
the, the aggressive no poach seems to be maybe a longstanding, but one example of just increased aggressive enforcement from the antitrust division. And so I guess, Lindsay, from your perspective, does that seem accurate? And Barry, as someone who lived through that, through those four years, is it fair to say that the antitrust division is being more aggressive uh, now than it was during the Trump years, or, or is there more nuance there? Lindsay? Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely more aggressive right now. I think it's exacerbated by comparing it to the last decade, right, where you had the, the division was very busy on investigations and, and cartel investigations, again, focused on largely conduct in, in Asia, but it, you know, it was relying on the leniency program a lot to have to bring cases in, and we should probably talk about the leniency program. So this seems new and more aggressive. They're definitely going to trial more often, but again, they have cases that are closer to the line that people aren't agreeing to, to, to plead to. Um, so I think it also seems more aggressive than maybe it is, but there, you know, there is a lot of saber rattling going on. They do have a very heavy trial load, as Barry already said, and they're, you know, they're not, they're not backing down. So we have, it's not a labor case, but we have the chicken case where they, they indicted 10 individuals. They've now been to trial twice in Colorado and had hung juries both times and now are planning to retry for a third time, five of the 10 executives and Jonathan Cantor, who's the head of the interest division, was asked to go out and speak to the judge about why a third trial is appropriate. And, it, you know, a third trial is just kind of mind boggling in some ways. And I think really highlights the how serious the division is about taking all of these cases to trial, query whether that's, you know, the best strategy, but um, to really to taking the tough cases and being willing to lose. Yeah, I mean, it just very, you know, to sort of key that up a little bit. I mean, one of the things yeah. when, you know, you and I were in government, we had to make decisions about a finite amount of resources. Everything can be a priority or nothing's a priority. And sometimes, you know, you you look for, if you're going to break new ground, you look for cases that, um, you know, have really strong facts because as we know, bad facts make bad law. So just curious on whether you think this is a stepped up aggressive antitrust division, or this is really much just more the fruits of many years of investigation. I think it's hard to say that the antitrust division is not being more aggressive right now. I mean, that's certainly the the desire. And 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 Jonathan is 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 now been there a few months. He he still doesn't have his his full complement of deputies. So which which surprises me, frankly, that that this this deep into the administration, he's still still waiting on some folks. But um, I mean, if you look back, President Biden of all things tweeted that uh, it's simple. Companies should have to compete for workers just like they compete for customers. And we need to get rid of non-compete clauses and no poaching agreements that do nothing but suppress wages. So that that's the reflects the sentiment of the Biden administration. Uh, there have been three, at least three new indictments uh, in, you know, since. And um, my expectation is that the 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 outcomes in the in Davida and Jindal will uh, Will, 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 will cause the division to, to take a little more time and think about how they're going to try these other cases and, 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 and learn, um, you know, learn, learn from past experience. Uh, I don't see them backing down. I, if anything, I see them looking for more opportunities and, and maybe cases with better facts and, 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 and maybe they'll, you know, make some changes in, 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 in trial strategy and, and those sorts of things. Um, but I, I, I do think they they have to deal with these headwinds. I mean, trying to um, try a case with 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 people out of the office and just just the the, the notion of preparing for a major trial on, on a criminal matter with with people um, out of the office is I, I it's it's I, I don't I don't know how you can do that and 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 so I think that is a, a drag on on the ability of the of the division to to to, to get. Get the job done. Um, you know that the, the FTE constraint um, is another real issue. That was an issue when we were there. Um, I know Macon was very aggressive about trying to get more money um, from the Hill, uh, and 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 that continues to be a need. Uh, and and then the novelty, of course, as I said before, is is a challenge. So I I, I think it. You know the administration intends to to stick to their guns and 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 continue to be aggressive in this area. At the same time, I there's a lot that can be done without um, without concern about being prosecuted criminally. I think that there 
if you go back to the 2016 document, it, it when it talks about what's criminal, it, it's pretty narrow. It's just a naked wage fixing, fixing or no poach agreements. It does go into detail about a lot of other things that you can do that may still be, you know, whether they're legal or illegal depends on the facts, but but um, they're not necessarily um, criminal or and, and won't be prosecuted criminally. And, and, and so, you know, I don't think people should assume that any sort of a non-compete or uh, a non-solicit arrangement is, is, is automatically a problem and, and, and might land you in jail. I think it just needs to be done in a proper way and has to, you know, be related to some other pro-competitive purpose and so on. So, um, it, it, it uh, but, but, but I do think with the prosecutions and, 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 and the press this is getting, which is part of the desired effect, um, some people might be chilled from uh, engaging in, in, in conduct that, that, that otherwise is perfectly fine. Well, your quote of the president tees up my first uh, question, uh, which arose when I took Doug Leslie's labor antitrust class at UVA in 1981. Um, so Congress passed the antitrust laws pursuant to the authority to regulate interstate commerce. And the first sentence of 15 U.S.C. Section 17, the premise for what comes later, says, and I quote, the labor of a human being is not a commodity or article of commerce, period, close quote. Why are we here? Why, isn't, why doesn't that doom all these prosecutions? It's an interesting point. Um, I never heard anybody raise that while I was at the antitrust division. Um, I, I don't know whether it's been thought through or, 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 or anyone's tried to advance that on, on the defense side, but, but, but that, that, that is a very interesting uh, point. I mean, I think the language you're referring to comes up in the context of, 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 of it goes on and talks about how, you know, labor unions are okay and those sorts of things. So it, 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 it I, I think it was sort of the predicate for what labor can do as, as a group, as opposed to what the employers can and can't do. But um, I've not had occasion to look into that in any depth or research it or heard anybody um, push the argument. So I haven't, I haven't been able to think through, but it, that, that, that's interesting. Lindsay, Zach, do you have any thoughts about that? I, I mean, I think Barry's right. I haven't seen it raised either. Um, maybe we need to tell the surgical care team to think about that. I think their motion to dismiss is still pending. But, um, you know, going back to high-tech cases, at the time, I think the the settlement in those high-tech cases was, again, civil. It was one of the most impactful um, labor-related antitrust cases ever. And so just labor as an antitrust issue is, is somewhat new. Um, looks like a couple of people popped in with questions, so I know we'll want to get to those in a, in a minute. But I, I guess, yeah, one of the things that comes out to me is, you know, as we're looking at this, you know, where the fairness argument, whether it's one of notice, whether it's one of, you know, actual harm. I mean, this this some of the enforcement in this area kind of strikes me as similar to that. Um, case where, you know, a uh, father and a son, you know, were snowmobiling and, you know, were, it was whiteout conditions and wound up, you know, on federally protected land. You know, is this, you know, this in some ways is almost being treated like a strict liability offense because, you know, there's no intent here um, with, with some of these individuals. I mean, the intent was to enter an agreement, but the intent was not necessarily to allocate the market. And so getting back to a point we're earlier talking about was, you know, with these jury instructions, you know, are we, is there now sort of a almost a willfulness um, piece to this, whereas, you know, for the longest time, it per se, has just been you got to know you're writing an agreement knowingly, not not that you have to know that there's any wrongfulness about it. So I think I think that's, um, you know, one piece that sticks out. The, the other part, um, you know, maybe before we get to these questions, Lindsay brought this up a minute ago, but, you know, in terms of the leniency process, um, you know, as a former prosecutor and someone who was, you know, constantly working with cooperators and having to make tough decisions on, you know, do you ever grant someone immunity and, you know, how does it work and, you know, how's that going to look at trial when you've got someone who, you know, got a free pass, you know, I, I think one of the things we don't talk about all that much, or, or maybe it's just in sort of cabin circles amongst the antitrust crowd is, you know, how unique the leniency provision is. Um, and so 
for those who are unaware, I mean, in its most basic form, it, it's a race to, to get in. And if you uncover something, unlike, you know, perhaps in the FCPA context, Foreign Corrupt Practice Act context, or other contexts where you're looking to get cooperation credit from DOJ, you kind of go in hat in hand and, you know, there's everyone can try to read tea leaves and look over the Phillip factors and, and try to understand, you know, can I get a declination or can I get a deferred prosecution agreement? But under the antitrust leniency policy, if you come in, you know, under uh, at a certain time, you know, before, you know, you've been made aware of an investigation, there's type A and type B leniency, you know, you can come in and put a marker down and then you can come back and request leniency. And if, if things go as planned, you know, you basically get, you know, complete exoneration of both the company and the individuals. Um, and one of the reasons for that is, is, you know, Lindsay and, and Barry know is then you basically cooperate against others who are part of that conspiracy with you. And it seems to me that's how the division has been extremely successful in making a lot of cases because they're getting an inside person who's coming in early and co cooperating completely. Well, just recently, um, the division changed some of its leniency requirements. And so in the no poach area, I'm curious how two things. One, if you don't know what you're doing is wrong, it's hard to run in and request leniency, although maybe now through things like this and these two trials, there'll be greater um, awareness. But two, one of the changes in the leniency policy is now that um, under type B leniency, where you know the government's already started an investigation, you're not necessarily carving in all employees. And there may be some employees who you know have to be jettisoned or have to be fired. Um, and that obviously puts into counsel representing individuals in a tough position because if you're trying to cooperate and the company wants everyone to cooperate and wants to get leniency at the same time the division saying we want to prosecute individuals and we can't tell you whether your person's carved in or not um, it may chill those companies that may be coming in for leniency so lindsay and barry i don't know if you have thoughts on how the leniency program changes um, are, are likely to affect um, you know criminal and i trust uh, leniency petitions in general and specific with no poach Barry, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I a lot of changes were made. I remember when when I first got there, I think somebody changed a couple words in a footnote, and the the defense bar got really excited. Um, so when I saw that the 50 FAQs, the <laughs> new, I. Uh, I, I, I kind of chuckled like I, I just did because uh, uh, I thought, wow, that's amazing. <laughs> um, did, you know, so it, it, it uh, you know, I, I don't know that it's going to have a, the changes will have a big impact. I, I think, you know, one of the things with the, with these no poach um, uh, situations is a lot of times it's, they're, 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 they're bilateral. So it, it's, 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 uh, you know, really just uh, two, two, two entities or individuals that are involved. And um, as I said, I, I was surprised at how often we came across documents and merger reviews that referenced no poach. Um, and, and, and we chased them down and some of them went nowhere and, 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 and some were real. Um, but the ones that went nowhere were sort of, um, highlighted the difficulty with these cases because unlike price fixing where you you know the CEO can say nope this is the price and and and, and it's done and, and 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 the prices are changed across the board um, hiring tends to be more um, decentralized and, and 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 much more of a, a a complex animal so to speak and 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 so you know you even saw in some of these cases arguments being made that that, well, you know, notwithstanding whatever agreement or understanding or, or statements that were made in text messages or, and, and so on, um, these companies were hiring people against each other, you know, from each other. So um, how could there have been any sort of an agreement? And if there was, it wasn't very effective. And, 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 and I think that, you know, as a practical matter becomes one of the challenges with these, with these cases, because it, you know, it begins to raise questions about whether, um, uh, the agreement was 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 effective and real, uh, and 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 I think that sort of lingers in the back uh, back of the mind of the of, uh, of the jurors. I would just add that I think the leniency updates. I mean, it, it, we'll see how they actually play out in practice. As they're written, I think they 
they could complicate leniency for a global cartel, the, the calculation. In the no poach space specifically, I think that the type, the change for type B carbon for, for individuals could complicate the division's mission. You know, they, it would be helpful for a trial for the division to be able to put something on the stand that says, I did this and I knew it was wrong because it sort of suggests that everybody else that's on trial should have known it was wrong as well. And if now you're not giving leniency to those people as easily, who are your witnesses going to be? So, I, you know, I think there is some tension there that we'll just have to see how it plays out. But it, it was an interesting timing, I thought, to release, some, you know, the first updates to the leniency policy since 1993, just as we're in the middle of all this other sort of upheaval. So it was a good, good question back. I have a, a second question, uh, again, from the point of view of an employment lawyer. There are probably employment lawyers watching this right now who are trying to help their clients end a war that started because one client decided that the cheapest way to steal a trade secret is to hire somebody away from a competitor, a senior salesperson, a senior engineer, an executive who carries around the trade secret in his or her head. And then there was retaliation, and then there was sir retaliation, and then there was sir, sir retaliation. And now we want to end the war because only the lawyers are winning. Can they have a peace treaty or will they be prosecuted if they, if they reach a peace treaty? I mean, from my standpoint, I think, you know, one of the things that the DeVita judge um, in his uh, order denying um, the motion to dismiss, which, again, I think that's, you know, everyone focuses on the acquittals because that's the outcome. But I think the division is you know, certainly focusing on the order of denying the motion to dismiss. So, you know, you lose the skirmish, but maybe maybe win the battle or the war um, that they can move forward. It talks about this this concept of ancillarity. And, you know, if you're well versed in antitrust, uh, criminal antitrust law, then you know what I'm talking about. But in, in its most basic form, you know, is the agreement that you're making ancillary to something else or is it naked? And the ancillary doctrine appears to be, you know, is there some bona fide reason for doing this? Is it limited in nature? Are there things that make this, um, yes, while it's restricting com restricting competition, um, is it part of some other agreement? You know, we, we're here in the DC area, there's a lot of government contractors who engage in joint ventures or teaming agreements, other things where there's going to be, you know, very sensitive bid data that goes back and forth or very sensitive IP. And, you know, it just, ha and if you're going to team up with someone else, you want to know that they're not going to, you know, immediately hire your best and brightest employees. So, you know, my, my thought would be not being a labor and employment lawyer, but if I were, if someone were drawing up some type of resolution or agreement, um, I certainly would want it to be something that um, includes a, a great amount of ancillarity to why are we doing this, the justification, narrowly tailored, um, and is not simply something that, uh, and, and maybe even reference with, within there, you know, this is not a no hire agreement. This is a non-solicitation for a period of X months because, um, you know, that's the cooling off period that we need. And we are also using every other remedy that we can in terms of non-disclosure agreements, et cetera. Um, but I, I do think you do run the risk of if you decide, all right, we're going to settle the case, then CEO A and CEO B get together and shake hands and say, all right, well, handshake deal, we're not going to hire each other's employees for a couple of years. I think you do have a problem. And this came up um, in the 1-800-CONTACTS case that the FTC prosecuted, which they only have civil jurisdiction, not criminal. Um, but, but there were uh, a series of settlements involving the use of the 1-800s trademark and, um, and, and, and the FTC prosecuted the parties for um, the uh, claiming the settlement agreements were anti-competitive because they, they, they reached some sort of a detente. And, uh, um, and, and so when, you, when, when something like that's embodied in a settlement agreement, and especially if, 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 if the judge and the court kind of signs off on it, I think it, you know, it would be hard to imagine how that would get prosecuted criminally. And, 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 and you need to think through sort of the, 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 the points that, that Zach made on, 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 on ancillarity um, so it, uh, you know, that, that situation is very different from one where you have an agreement between two companies, CEO or HR, um, VPs or whoever, where, where that, that, that's naked, that's not connected to anything whatsoever. It's just, it's, 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 it's a separate agreement. There's no, no, you know, plausible 
argument that it's ancillary to anything. And, 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 and if you're in that box, you're, you're clearly, you know, in, in some trouble. Um, and, and so, you know, all these things I think turn very heavily on, on, on the particular facts of the situation, just like in the, you know, the picker case that I mentioned that, uh, um, that DOJ weighed in on, I mean, that's, uh, in, in state, in, in Nevada court. And there, I mean, it's interesting um, that the, uh, you know, one of the things that the, that the division picked up on is, is that this particular um, restraint affected about two thirds of the anesthesiologists in that market. So I think that makes a difference. Um, if it's 10% versus two thirds and how long is the restraint? How broad is it? What, what, what is the reason for it? I mean, all those things need to be taken into account. Um, and, and so there isn't a simple kind of bright line answer to the first question about how to advise medical groups that frequently have non-competes and non-solicits. I mean, you need to, you need to sort of go through the analysis that, that Zach described in the, in the one that, that the division outlined in this Pickard case. That, that's, that's how you need to think about it and, 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 and tee it up. We're within our last 10 minutes of our hour. Um, so let me turn to the Q&A. The first question uh, I think is one we touched on. How should one advise medical groups that frequently have non-competes and non-solicits? Barry, um, if you take the president's uh, tweet uh, in, in its broadest meaning, I, I would suggest that all such agreements are per se antitrust violations, but that can't be the department's position, I, right? I, I, I don't, I don't, that's not how I would think about it. Um, I, I think there's a lot that can be done. It just needs to be um, ancillary to some uh, uh, pro-competitive endeavor. And, and a lot of times, like if, if, if the doctors are actually developing relationships through the practice group or the hospital with the patients, um, and, and, and that's being done, uh, they're, they're benefiting from the introductions that the hospital or the practice group provides. Um, in, in my view, it's perfectly reasonable to say, you can't then you know, go and, 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 and take all of the patients I introduced to you and then walk out the door and start your own practice overnight, that there needs to be some, you know, it, 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 there needs to be some cooling off period because otherwise it creates a disincentive um, to, uh, you know, to, to provide that kind of access. And, 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 and the key is like whether the restraint is reasonable. I would, I agree with all of that, obviously. I would just add that, you know, bad documents can really sink you. I think everybody should be expecting more scrutiny in, in this area, even if it's things like Barry just talked about that might not be criminally prosecuted, you might get questions about it. And so bad documents can really sink an analysis when the government, you know, starts to ask questions. So think, be careful and thoughtful about your conversations as you, as you enter into those types of agreements or draft them. And also, you know, consider putting pro just pro competitive justifications either in the document itself or have an ancillary document that you create at the same time that says, these are why, these are the reasons why this particular restriction is appropriate. I'm going to skip a few questions to get to one we haven't touched on, which I frankly interests me. Uh, and the question is, does the prosecution impermissibly shift the burden of proof to the defense when the prosecution's theory basically requires the defense to explain why the agreement is not criminal under the Sherman Act? Sounds yeah. like it does, but I thought that the, I always thought the prosecution had the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt. So, um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would say, you know, having been um, living with that burden and trying to establish, you know, each element of defense beyond a reasonable doubt, you know, I think Barry's right that in the end, you know, the, the prosecution has to prove their case. And unlike the rule of reason where there is this burden shifting and hence civil, I mean, the way I look at it is, um, you know, what, and it seems like the defense did in the Davida cases, they're really, um, you know, they're certainly through cross-examination poking holes in the government's arguments. They're establishing, um, you know, through expert testimony, they decided to put on a case, although, you know, they're certainly under no constitutional requirement too, um, in terms of showing that there's no harm. And so I, I, I guess I would say, I don't think there's a bur an actual burden shift because it's still on the government to prove each and every element, but with a new novel, um, and as, as Barry's made the point multiple times where you're dealing with 
you know, the purchase side, or I think everyone would understand if the four of us allocated the four um, geographic regions of um, the market for, say, beef sales, and we decide we're each going to get a corner and we're not going to have to compete against each other. And therefore, you know, we can keep prices high. That's one thing. But if we say, you know, we're going to allocate the market for, um, you know, mid-level associates, um, it, it gets a little bit more difficult. So I do think that um, in the spirit of the question, there's one that if you just sit there in silence and don't have both effective cross-examinations and an effective defense or rebuttal, um, you may be leaving something on the table. I think it's more of a trial strategy than anything else. But as as we saw from the DeVita um, case, and it's interesting, Wilmer Hale actually wrote up um, their own article on, hey, this is the view from the litigation standpoint. One of the things that I thought was interesting was they said, look, we all agreed there were agreements here, or you know, we admitted um, that there were these agreements. There was proof that really wasn't that issue. It's what those agreements were about. And so um, I, I think that's a very insightful question because it does seem as though that almost meant that the trial strategy was, you know, we're not simply going to sit back and, you know, put the government to their burden. We're going to explain to this jury that, yes, there were agreements, but they weren't agreements that, um, you know, were, were illegal. Lindsay, I'm going to spin one of these questions your way um, because the spin version of this interests me more. Um, if a jury were to have convicted the defendants in one of these cases that were recently resolved, which one would you want to have been convicted for the purpose of making good law and appeal and why? Of the two that have been, we've had convictions, probably DeVita, that's the, that, so Jindal was the other one where there, there are acquittals and that's a, that's a wage fixing case. I think that's a, I think no poach is more novel, frankly. Um, so DeVita would be the case that I'd want to see go up on appeal. And I think, you know, the, the facts were muddy there. Um, and I think you could raise as the questioner identified due process arguments. I, I do think we will see appeals when there is a conviction. Um, it'll be interesting to see when that happens and what court it's in. But, you know, I think I think due process is what they're raising at the motion to dismiss. And I think that we're going to see that theme continue. I don't know if Barry or Zach have thoughts of additional. Yeah, I, I can't. I can't. So Jindal was was in the pipeline when I was there, so I can't say too much. It, it, it got filed after. But I'll just say that and it's totally public. Um, that case was prosecuted first by the FTC. Yeah. Which only has civil jurisdiction. And uh, and then DOJ picked it up. So that's all I'll say. Guy, we just have time left for you to get in your closing remarks. Thank you, panelists. You've done a wonderful job. I've really enjoyed the discussion. Yes, thank you all. On behalf of the Federalist Society, I want to thank our experts for the benefit of their valuable time and expertise today. And I want to thank our audience for joining and participating. We also welcome listener feedback by email at info at fed-soc.org. As always, keep an eye on our website and your emails for announcements about upcoming virtual events. Thank you all for joining us today. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thanks.